So I had a number of international uh, friends in college, and I loved the time that I spent with them. I mean, I, I felt like, in a sense, I was kind of traveling the world through the stories that I was told. I got to learn a little Swahili. I learned a little of uh, African form of French from some of my friends uh, who lived across the hall from me. And so I had really great uh, relationships with a number of people from Africa. And yesterday, I got a call from one of them, and he was passing through town, and he said, could I stop by? So he stopped by for about an hour, and he told me some really interesting things. Now, I'm not going to tell you his name or where he's from because, uh, well, you'll see why I'm going to keep that part out of the story here in a minute. But um, he... he uh, was telling me about his experiences. He's, uh, he had his family who, uh, he married an American girl and he moved them to the country in Africa that he's from for a good while. And he just recently moved them back because, one of the reasons is because he has started a political, um, a political movement to depose a dictator. And so here I'm sitting on my back porch with a guy who is basically in opposition against what we'd probably deem a king. Uh, and he is in a, you know, this kind of political battle, and they are trying to figure out a way to get the current dictator of this country voted out of office. And so I'm thinking, this is amazing. I mean, this is the kind of stuff we read in the Bible, because I'm thinking about what we've been reading in Judges, you know. And... Um, and so this, this guy, my friend, he, if, they, if they're successful, he will ultimately probably be the vice president of the country that he grew up in. And he's on my porch. And I just thought how interesting that, you know, these sort of grassroots movements can happen. Now, here's why I tell you that. Because it is almost exactly the situation, well, not exactly. It is similar to the situation we're going to look at in Judges today. It's the kind of thing that is going on in the world even still today. And so here's what it made me think. I, I was telling my father-in-law this story about my friend who is you know, uh, working on this political issue. And he said, you know, that's the situation that most of the world lives in. I mean, in the United States, we have a very stable political system. I'm not endorsing or, or denying it. I'm just saying it's, it's stable. We kind of know what to expect. But most of the world, for most of the world's history, has been in a really unpredictable and really dangerous situation. Like my friend, he might get killed. I mean, he, they may kill him, and he admits that. You know, they may, they may shoot him, you know, in his... Um, you know, in his sleep, or they may drag him out and make an example of him. That's the kind of world that he lives in when he goes there. And so, and, and here's the interesting thing. He's got dual citizenship, so he doesn't have to go back. And so his wife would really rather him not go back, if you, if you can understand that. And so that's the kind of situation that a lot of the world lives in. Um, and so it's the situation that the world has been in really from very early on, and that's what we see in Judges. So there's a lot of people in the world today who read books of the Bible, like Judges, and they say, I get it, because that's, that's kind of like my country. It's wild. It's dangerous. You're, you're, you, know, you possibly could be killed for opposing a leader. And so all of that to say, let's take a look at the sometimes gut-wrenching uh, book of Judges. We're going to be looking at Judges 9. Now, I want to I remind you of a couple verses that we looked at last week uh, because they kind of set up what we're going to be talking about today. So this is kind of our backstory. Last week, we talked about Gideon. Do you remember Gideon? Gideon, we, we covered a lot with Gideon. He was a kind of a military leader. He also was the one that tested God with the fleece and the dew. Very interesting situation. But there's this line towards the end of Gideon's story that will help us kind of make sense of what's going to happen in the next chapter. So in 822, it says, Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. Okay, so this is at the end of Gideon's story. And basically, the people of Israel are saying, we want you as king. We want you to become our king. Now, the reason why they probably want that is because Gideon um, delivered them militarily. In fact, that's what they say. He delivered them militarily. So they're looking at the situation saying, here's a guy that could lead us. Now, what Gideon goes on to say is this. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. 
Now, we need to remember that because that through line is going to go entirely through the story we're going to look at today. If the people were to follow what Gideon says right here, there is going to be a lot that they could avoid. But I bet you can guess that they don't always follow what their judges say. In fact, we've seen it over and over that God even said to the people that... um, I mean, Judges, the book of Judges says that they would follow, but they would not listen to their judges. So let's jump into chapter 9, and let's see what happens. Now, there's going to be a number of names in here, and I'm going to do my best to remind you of who they are. Um, And so this is just going to be kind of a story. Not an uplifting story, but it's a story. So let's see what it says. Then Abimelech, the son of Jerubbabel, went to Shechem. Okay, a couple of things there. I said Jerubbabel wrong. Uh, it's Jerubbaal. Jerubbaal. Uh, I've been saying it wrong for a few weeks, actually. So Jerubbaal is actually Gideon. You'll remember from the first story we saw of Gideon, he got this kind of special name, and it means something like the one who struggles against Baal. And so this is the son of Gideon. Okay, so Abimelech, the son of Gideon, went to Shechem. Okay, so... All of that, here we go, to his mother's brothers and spoke with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father saying, okay, that's a lot. Let me just, let me just sum it up. Gideon's son was talking with his family. That's basically what we're seeing. (laughs) Gideon is talking to his relatives here. So let's see what he has to say. Please speak in the hearing of all the men of Shechem. Okay, so here's Abimelech speaking to his family. Please speak in the hearing of all the men of Shechem, which is, which is better for you, that all 70 of the sons of... I'm going to replace Jerubal with Gideon so we can kind of keep it straight. So that all 70 of the sons of Gideon reign over you or that one reign over you. Okay, now you're thinking 70 sons. Yeah, you remember at the end of Gideon's story, it told us that he had 70 sons. He had a number of wives and a number of concubines. So he had 70 sons. And it was among those sons that the people wanted to find a ruler. Okay, so so this is Abimelech, one of Gideon's sons. So he says, which is better for you, that all 70 of the sons of Gideon reign over you, or that one reign over you? Remember that I am your flesh and bone. So here's basically what's happening probably at this time is that the 70 sons of Gideon are probably have formed some kind of a leadership group, okay? And so they're probably leading the people. And so here Abimelech is saying, wouldn't it be better to just have one leader? And by the way, we're related. Okay, so he's kind of making the case that he ought to be the leader rather than this group of 70 sons. Verse 3, And his mother's brothers spoke all these words concerning him in the hearing of all the men of Shechem, and their heart was inclined to follow Abimelech. For they said, He is our brother. Now here's what's maybe a little bit sad about this. What are they judging their, uh, his leadership ability on? Not really his leadership ability. It's the fact that they're related. It's not because he has proven himself to be a great leader. His pitch is, hey, we're related, so shouldn't I rule over you? You remember how Gideon was? I come from that line. You know, we're related. And so they choose him as... A leader. Verse 4, so they gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Barith. Now, Baal Barith is a, he was known as the, um, the god of covenant. And so I think, this is my theory, I don't, I don't find this in commentaries, but my theory is that they're making a covenant with, um, with Abimelech and they're kind of sealing it by. Um, uh, drawing on the authority of Baal Barith. Uh, side note, this is interesting to me. Baal Barith was, um, they worshipped him in, the, in, in idol form, and he took the form of a fly. And so there were people who carried around little emblems. I mean, there, there was the temple for this, uh, this foreign god, but they also carried around little emblems, probably little carved images of Baal Barith. And um, some, some rabbis called him um, Baalzebub. And so they would carry it around, and every once in a while they'd pull it out, 
and they'd give it a kiss. And so it, this, this foreign god kind of went with them everywhere they went. It, was just a, it just sort of permeated their culture. And the reason why that matters is because I think the author is telling us that these people are in covenant with this foreign god. This is not a God-sanctioned judge. Right? I mean, we've seen judges so far, and if you look at what's about to happen, I don't want us to be confused to think that this is one of God's judges, because what's going to happen is really quite disturbing. Okay, so they take some silver from this temple. Uh, my guess is they make some kind of covenant with him, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless men, and they followed him. That line to me is amazing. It sounds like a, a rock and roll band from the late 90s, worthless and reckless men. Uh, it's just like, it, it tells us everything we need to know about the folks that were following Abimelech. They were reckless, which would mean that they wreck everything they touch, probably, and they're worthless, which probably means they're just there for the money. They're not there because they're, they're ideologues. They're not there because they believe in anything. They're there because they're getting paid. And so this is the kind of army that Abimelech uh, sort of uh, brings together through that money. Verse 5, Then he went to his father's house. So this is Abimelech. Then he went to his father's house. Who's his father? Gideon, that's right. So Gideon was his father. Now Gideon is out of the picture by now. Then he went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the 70 sons of Jerubbaal. On a, that name still messes me up. 70 sons of Gideon on one stone. This is, this is horrifying. Okay, so he goes to his father's household, and I, I don't know how this would work. It's got to be more than just Abimelech. It's the men that he hired, and this probably looked somewhat like a small skirmish or a battle, but he takes them and he executes them because of who they are. Now think about this. Abimelech, his pitch for power was that he's related and so he goes and he takes all of the sons that are related to him, probably half-brothers, because I think he was probably the son of a, uh, a concubine. We'll see that later on. So probably half-brothers. He takes them and he executes them. He murders them. Now, this is not uncommon if you study the history of kings. This is what often happens. And like I said, this is the kind of situation the world has been in for a very long time. I mean, we can thank God that this is not what happens every time a leader is changed in the United States. But most countries that have lived in this kind of monarchy, this would be common. When a new king comes into power, there's usually a lot of people that get killed because they uh, pose a threat to that power. So, it's horrifying. It's terrible what he does. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubal, was left because he hid himself. Okay? So he kills, it says 70 sons, but it might mean that he killed 69 sons and one gets away. And that one son of Gideon who gets away is Jotham. Now, Jotham is going to come into the story here in just a moment. And all the men of Shechem gathered together, all of Beth Milo, and they went and made Abimelech king beside the terebinth tree at the pillar that was in Shechem. Okay, so they make Abimelech king after he does this. It's not like they make him king and then he does it because they're like, oh, we really messed up. They see what he did. He just murdered 70 or, you know, about 70 people. And now they say, yeah, we want that guy. This tells you where the hearts of the people are. They are in a dark place. Verse 7, Now when they told Jotham, he went and stood on top of Mount Gerzim and lifted his voice and cried out, and he said to them, Listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. Now, what we're, about to, what we're about to see is a really interesting kind of allegory, and I want us to know that. He's, he's going to give an allegory for what's going on. Okay, so this is Jotham. He is the son of Gideon who escaped being murdered by Abimelech. Okay? So now he is kind of giving this kind of allegorical sermon. He's up on Mount Gerzim, uh, you know, and apparently there's an audience there, and so here's what he says. The trees once went forth to anoint a king over them. And they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, should I cease giving my oil with which they honor God and men and, go and have sway over trees? Then the trees said to the fig tree, you come and give rain over us. But the fig tree said to them, Should I cease my sweetness and my good fruit and go to sway over trees? Verse 12, Then the trees said to the vine, 
You come and reign over us. But the the vine said to them, Should I cease my new wine, which cheers both God and men, and go to sway over trees? Verse 14, Then all the trees said to the bramble, which is like thorns, right? Said to the bramble, You come and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, If in truth you anoint me as king over you, then come and take shelter in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now, therefore, if you have acted in truth and sincerity in making Abimelech king, and if you have dealt with, uh, well with Jerubal and his house and have done to him uh, as he deserves... For my father fought for you, risked his life, and delivered you out of the hand of Midian. But you have risen up against my father's house this day, and killed his seventy sons on one stone, and made Abimelech the son of his female servant, king over men of Shechem, because he is your brother. Now, I kind of read all that together because this is a speech that Jotham's giving. And I want to just kind of go back to what he says in the beginning because I think it's really interesting. So he gives this allegory of the trees. Okay? It's almost like a fairy tale in a sense, but it has a purpose. It's a, it's a moral story, so to speak. And what he says is it's as if the trees asked one tree to lead them. And they asked the best of the best first, right? What was the first? It wasn't the, was it the olive tree. They asked one of the best trees. But that tree is very busy doing good things. And so he says, you know, I can't really be your leader. So they ask maybe what we could consider the next best. That tree's busy doing good things. And so he, he can't be the leader. And so they get down to a thorn bush. And the thorn bush ain't doing nothing that's worth anything. So he's got nothing but time on his hands. He said, yeah, I think I could probably do that for you. And so they ask the bramble to lead them. And what does he do? He responds with scorn and torture of the rest by saying, flames will come out from me. And so his al- allegory here I think is still applicable today. In fact, I, I had these words kind of ringing in my head as my friend from Africa was telling me about the situation in his home country. Because often the person who is very busy doing good work, very busy doing important work, is probably not going to seek after leadership, probably not going to seek after being a monarch or a king. Very often it's those who don't have anything else going on, that find themselves in places of power. And this is his warning. This is his warning that if you take a king in the way that you've taken a king, then this is what you ought to expect. You ought to expect he's going to act in the way that he's proven he will act. And so, you know, one of the questions that I asked my friend, who was sitting on our porch, is, and, you know, this is kind of a bold question, but we're pretty close. And so, you know, I said, how, how do you stay or how do you keep from becoming corrupt? If you are elected in the, in the country where you grew up and history has proven over and over and over that the leaders of, those, of, of certain countries, you know, they, they become corrupt because they, they have all this wealth coming in. They can't seem to handle the, uh, you know, the temptation that comes with wealth and they become corrupt and then they begin to hurt people. How do you keep from doing that? And he had an answer, and I I don't know how good of an answer it was, but that's what I fear. That's what I would fear if I was put into that place. When you see the history that's happened in that country, and we see it in Judges, it's this cycle. This cycle of sin and corruption continues and continues. Now, let's see if Jotham's words are, uh, this is the conclusion of Jotham's words, verse 19. If then you have acted in truth and sincerity with Jerubal and with his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and Beth Milo. And let fire come from the men of Shechem and from Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away and fled, and he went to beer and dwelt there. That doesn't mean he went to drinking. It's a place. He went to beer 
and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. So Jotham delivers this sermon and then runs away. Can you imagine the, the, what kind of sermon I'd have to deliver that I felt like I needed to run away from you guys at the end? Oh, there's been Sundays where I thought maybe I need to run. But he gives this, this scathing sermon and then he goes and he hides. And basically what he's saying is to the people, if you elect, elect's not the right word, if you anoint uh, Abimelech as your king, then you're going to get what you deserve. Because what's going to happen is more of the same. You've already seen how he treated his own brothers. How do you think he's going to treat you? So it's going to be more of the same. And so he's, he's issuing this warning against the people. Now, I think Gideon's words should be ringing in our head. Remember what Gideon said? I will not rule over you. My son will not rule over you. God will rule over you. If they were to listen to Gideon, I mean, that was, a, that was a historic moment. Certainly there's people at this point that remember that, but they abandon it. They walk away from it, and they move toward Abimelech, this cruel warlord. 23, God sent a spirit of ill will between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. That's a really interesting line to me, and I can't, I can't necessarily, I can't explain it necessarily. God sent a spirit of ill will. Some people say, you know, then it's not, it's not Abimelech's fault if God sent this spirit of ill will. I think the thing to remember is God is just moving this person in the direction he's already going. Like if you look at, sometimes it comes up that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. You remember that in the story of the, uh, the Exodus? Well, what you'll notice in that story, for instance, is that it first tells us that Pharaoh hardened his heart, and then it tells us that God hardened his heart. So it seems that the person chooses the path, but then at times God will speeden that, speeden, is that a word? That's not a word. He will hasten that hardening. So Abimelech had a path already set, but God sends this spirit to sort of bring it about or, or kind of continue it to make it happen possibly a little bit faster. So God sent a spirit of ill will between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. Now, Shechem is where Abimelech is the king of over. And so there becomes now this tension. And the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. 24, that the crime done to the 70 sons of Jerubal might be settled and their blood be laid on Abimelech, their brother who killed them, and on the men of Shechem who aided him in the killing of his brothers. Basically, it's come back around, right? I mean, for about three years, Abimelech has this rule over Shechem, but now that crime sort of sat in the air and it's now it's resting back down on them like the, like the dust from an explosion or the rubble. They now are having to deal with their own sin. Verse 25, and the men of, Shechem sent, uh, men of Shechem set men in ambush against him on the tops of the mountains, and they robbed all who passed by them along the way, and it was told Abimelech. Now this is interesting. They go up on the mountains to try to capture Abimelech, but what do they do? They rob everybody that comes by. So this tells us a little bit about the nature of the people that are even opposing Abimelech. So you've got Abimelech bad guy. You got his followers, worthless and reckless people. You got those who are opposing Abimelech, they're bad people too. They're ambushing and, and robbing people. So basically everybody everywhere is bad at this point. We don't really have a good character except for maybe Jotham who left town and we don't really know much about even him. Verse 26, now Gaal, the son of Ebed, came with his brothers and went over to Shechem, and the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. Okay, so you're saying, who's this guy? Well, we just, he's just been introduced to us, okay? So he's a new leader. Okay, so we got Abimelech, we got the worthless and reckless men, we got those who are opposing him, and now those who are opposing him have found themselves a new Abimelech, basically, because he's not a good guy either. We'll see that as we go along. Now, Gaal, the son of Ebed, came with his brothers and went over to Shechem, and the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. Remember what Gideon said, I will not rule over you, God will rule over you. But here, this new leader comes, and what do they do? They put their confidence in him. They don't cry out to God. Why are they not crying out to God? That's been the cycle. Now they seem to be hardening their hearts and they're looking for another warlord to dislodge the last warlord that they put in power. It's getting really sticky. So they went out into the fields and gathered grapes from their vineyards and trod them and made merry. Basically, they got drunk. 
They made some wine. Now, I'm, just a side note, I always thought it takes a while for wine to ferment. So I don't know if we're, if we're seeing an expanse of time here, if they have some method for fermenting quickly. Maybe you could tell me after the sermon if there's a way to do that. Not that I'll... Well, maybe I would. I don't know. That'd be kind of fun. Maybe we'll make some wine uh, for the chili cook-off next week. Anyway, um, so they get, some, they get grapes. They trod them. They make merry. They basically make wine. And they went into the house of their God and ate, drank, and cursed Abimelech. Ugh, okay. More bad guys, basically. Okay, so you got one bad guy camp. And that's Abimelech and his guys. Now you got Gaal, and he's drunk in, where is he? In the house of his God. He's in a temple. He's drinking. I, I guess I'm kind of thinking of his temple sort of as a bar in a sense because they're drinking and probably eating. And they're in there drunkenly cursing Abimelech. Now remember, Abimelech is technically the king of the area, right? He's kind of like this regional king. And so this drunk guy who's kind of leading a, a, a ragtag band of oppositionists is in the bar saying, uh, terrible things about Abimelech. Now, you can bet there's probably somebody that's going to hear him that is connected to Abimelech. So let's see what happens. 28, then Gaal the son of Ebed said, because so now it's going to tell us what he's saying uh, drunkenly about Abimelech. Who is Abimelech and who is Shechem that we should serve? Are you okay if I do drunk voice? I want to do drunk voice. I'm just going to do drunk voice because he's drunk, right? So who is Abimelech and who is Shechem that we should serve him? Is he not the son of Jerubal and is not Zebul his officer? How could you say those words drunk? It's amazing. <laughs> uh, serve the men of Hamar, the father of Shechem. But why should we serve him? Okay, so we've just been introduced to a new person, by the way. Okay, so Jerubal's who? Gideon, okay. Now, uh, so this is the, so Abimelech's the son of Gideon, but now he's telling us who kind of the general is. He says, and is not Zerubal his officer. So Zerubal is apparently kind of the general or the leader of Abimelech's um, worthless and reckless men. So he's the chief worthless, worthless and reckless man, apparently. So, he's, uh, th- so this is Gaal basically saying, why are we serving him? We shouldn't serve him. He's a no good whatever, you know. So he's questioning their service to Abimelech. And you can see it there in the last line, but why should we serve him? If only this people were under my authority. Now imagine a drunk guy in a foreign god's temple saying this. They're saying, he's saying, why are we following Abimelech? We should be following me. I mean, he's just, it's, it's, it's just awful. This, anyway, then I would remove Abimelech. Oh, there are fighting words. Okay, up to this point, he's just questioning his leadership, but now he's just made a threat against the administration. That's a big no-no in the ancient world. Even today, you, you shouldn't make direct threats about, well, you just shouldn't. Let's just, this, none of this is prescriptive, okay? So don't do any of this, but this is one that's really dangerous. So he's saying, I should be in charge. This drunk guy, this drunk sort of semi-leader of the opposition is saying, I should be in charge. And isn't this the way that power works? When you get a little bit of power, you don't say, oh, I am so satisfied with the amount of power I have. I get a little bit of wealth. I'm so satisfied with the wealth that I have. No, that's not how it works. Our sin nature, especially for these characters who are not seeking after God, their sin nature takes over and makes the chasm bigger and says, you need more, more, more. And here's Gaal, who probably could have began you know, as just saying, we need to remove Abimelech, but now the, the chasm gapes and he wants more. He wants power. He wants the, the wealth that comes with power. And here he is drunkenly slandering the current leader. Verse 30, when Zebul, the, rule of, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gaal, the son of Ebed, his anger was aroused. Now, I'm going to test you. Who's Zebul? Officer, that's right. So he's the officer of Abimelech. So Abimelech's officer, now we kind of find out that he's, he's sort of functioning like a mayor. Now, in the ancient world, a, a king could be a king of what we might call a city-state. So you'd have kind of like a main city, and then that, that city would be large enough to rule an area. And so it seems like Zebul is the officer, meaning kind of a, kind of a military leader probably, but also probably like a, a city manager or a, a mayor in a sense. So Abimelech and then Zebul. 
Zebul. Okay, so Zebul kind of has his ear to the ground here. When Zebul, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gaal, the son of Ebed, his anger was aroused. And so he takes it, he hears it, and he takes it as a threat to the administration. He takes it as a threat to the state. Now, here's the thing. When you get drunk and you start shooting off at the mouth, somebody's going to hear you. That's not necessarily the lesson today, but it is a lesson to remember, just in case any, you know, any of us are you know, prone to do that. So, so Gael gets heard. He gets, and somebody's listening, you know, and then he was, doing, he was playing a dangerous game, right? So somebody hears him, and it gets back to Zebul. 31, and he sent messengers to Abimelech secretly saying, take note, Gaal, the son of Ebed, and his brothers have come to Shechem, and here they are fortifying the city against you. Okay, so apparently Abimelech is somewhere else, and so he gets a note. You can imagine that day he gets that note that Gaal, this person, uh, you know, he gives him his heritage so he can be sure who it is. He is fortifying the city against you. Now that could mean, uh, you know, multiple things. I think it probably means both physically fortifying, but also he's turning the city against you. He's speaking out. Uh, you know, he, he's in the temples talking about how he should replace you and how you should be removed. Now, you can imagine how this is going to go. Verse 32, now, therefore, get up by night and the people who are with you and lie in wait in the field. Now, if I'd like to think if this was happening in a, a more forward thinking country, they'd say, you know, you guys ought to have a debate. You ought to get on CNN and, you know, you, you talk out the issues. You know? but that's not how it worked back then. The way that they would do it, apparently, is go hide and wait for him to pass by and chop him into pieces. That's the advice of his officer. Okay, So I think there's another lesson in this. Again, I don't know that it's the lesson of this, this story, but it's important who you get advice from. Because this is Abimelech's officer. This is one of his great advisors. It's his, his number two guy. And the advice that Abimelech is getting is pretty awful. And so I I don't know who you surround yourself with, but it's it's something to remember that the people we surround ourselves with, the, uh, the advice we get from them is often what we are going to do. And so that's exactly what we see with Abimelech. He wasn't getting good advice. Verse 33, and it shall be as soon as the sun is up in the morning that you shall rise early. This is still Zebul talking. Early and rush upon the city. And when he and the people who are with him come out against you, you may then do to him as you find opportunity. That's a nice way of saying something really awful. So basically what... what um, Abimelech's officer, Zebul, is saying is you should hide in the fields and then at first light you should rush on the city and basically attack your own city. Okay, so that's, just think about that for a second. He's the, we'll call him the, um, the mayor. The mayor of the city is saying to Abimelech, you should come and attack the city that you rule over. I mean, it's, it's nuts. Strategically, it's, it's a mess. Verse 34 So Abimelech and all the people who were with him rose by night and lay in wait against Shechem in four companies. Four companies, probably enough to surround the entire city, right? So 35, when Gael the son of Ebed went out and stood in the entrance to the city gate, Abimelech and the people who were with him rose from lying in wait. Okay, so just let's just get the scene. So Abimelech's army is around the city, and Gael, remember he's maybe has a a hangover this day. I don't know. This is probably a a few days later or, you know, a couple of weeks later. Who knows? But Gael comes out to the city gate, and and they begin to, uh, and he sees what's going on. And so it says, Abimelech and the people who are with him rose from lying in wait. Okay, so Abimelech, I'm sorry. Oh, it's a lot of names. Okay, so uh, Gael is in the city gate. He's standing there looking out, and what does he see coming up out of the, the grain fields? An army stands up. I mean, you can imagine this moment. This is, this is frightening. And now he's probably thinking, how much did I have to drink? What did I say? What have I done? I mean, he probably is beginning to realize the situation he's in. Verse 36, and when Gaal saw the people, he said to Zebul, look, people are coming down from the tops of the mountains. Okay, now think about this for a second. So Gaal is talking to Zebul. Zebul Remember, he's kind of the mayor, we'll call him the mayor of Shechem. And so Gaal is saying to who he thinks probably is kind of an ally, look, there's an army out there. Now, who's the army he's pointing at? He's pointing at the army of Abimelech. He apparently doesn't know that Zebul is 
uh, loyal to Abimelech. This is getting really complicated, but you kind of get you kind of see it. So so Gael is now about to either have to pay for what he said or back it up or something. So let's see what happens. Look, people are coming down from the tops of the mountains, but Zebul said to him, "You see the shadows of the mountains as they were men." So Zebul is telling. Gael, that you're, you're seeing things. Maybe he's implying that you're still drunk. Maybe you, you haven't really come out of the stupor yet. And so he's saying, no, 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 no. You're not, you know, you're, not, you're not seeing it clearly. Notice what happens, 37. So Gael spoke again and said, See, people are coming down from the center of the land, and another company is coming from the diviner's terebinth tree. So Gael is seeing these four companies of soldiers and worthless and reckless men that Abimelech has guard, uh, coming around the city. Now, it seems to me that Gael is really seeing it for what it is. There is an army that's about to attack the city. Now, he doesn't apparently know that that army is led by the king of that city. And so, man, it's a mess. 38, then Zebul said to him, where indeed is your mouth now? <laughs> oh, I could just imagine like, you know that feeling you get when you realize you just got caught? And for me, it's kind of like a uh, kind of like a quick sweat that happens, and my heart begins to to race. You know, I I remember as a kid getting caught in a lie or caught you know one time stealing a cinnamon roll, and it immediately is like a oh what what have I done? You know, and so he says, "Where is your mouth now, with which you said, who is Abimelech that we should serve him? Are not these people whom you despised? Go out, if you will." and fight with them now. And so, uh, as far as we can tell, Gaal is by himself in the city gate, and Zebul is saying, why don't you go and take him on? I mean, here he is. He's right here. I mean, yeah, he's got an army with him, but there he is. Go for it. You know, you said you can handle him. Verse 39, so Gaal went out leading the men of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. So Gaal gathers his men, and they go out and they fight. Now, here's what I want you to see this as. It'd be easy. If we just read this, we'd think, oh, it's just another one of those God-ordained battles of the Bible, right? Because there are those. There's, there's conquest. There's times when God leads his people. We actually we saw it in the last chapter with Gideon. This is not one of those times. This is a barroom brawl. Because think about it. I mean, you got Abimelech who is trouble, right? And he needs to be removed. But the way that it, this all comes about is somebody got drunk and spouted off in a bar, basically, in a temple, and now there's a war, there's a skirmish that's going to happen because of it. None of this is good. It's all just such a mess. I know I'm saying that a lot today, but I don't know what other word I could use. It's a mess. Verse 40, And Abimelech chased him, and he fled from him, and many fell wounded to the very entrance of the gate. Okay, so the, the battle happens, and uh, Abimelech is, seems is winning, and Gael flees. He runs away. Now, what's going to happen now is Abimelech is going to chase Gael, and uh, it's going to tell us where he goes. So, so uh, you kind of got to see it. That we're sort of dividing the forces now. So Abimelech and his guys are going to continue to follow Gael. 41, then Abimelech dwelt at Erma. Now, what it means by dwelt, I think, is just he stayed there. He chased Gael to a certain point called Aramah, and then he stayed there. Okay, so Abimelech is not in Shechem now. He's in Aramah, and uh, Zebul drove out Gael and his brothers so that they would not dwell in Shechem. Now, there's a little bit of a confusion here for me because it sounds like it's saying that Abimelech is chasing uh, Gael, but now it says Zebul drove out Gael from the city. I think what it means is uh, Gael's forces. I think what it's saying is Zebul sort of leads a local army to cleanse the city of everybody that was following Gael, and Abimelech now is chasing the rest of the army. Which location is Gael? I'm actually not sure. And maybe he's at Shechem. Maybe he's being chased by Abimelech. We'll see. Uh, as we go along. 42, and it came about on the next day that the people went out into the field and they told Abimelech. Okay, so Abimelech is still out of the city and the, the battle happens. They, they cleanse the city of, of Gaal and all the people that, he follow, that follow him. Now they go out and tell Abimelech. So he took his people, divided them into three companies and lay in wait in the field. And he looked and there were the people coming out of the city and he rose against them and attacked them. Now, who are the people that he just drove out? Well, 
anybody that was following Gael was driven out of the city. And so this would include probably families. I mean, I would, I would think this is going to include the men who are fighting men that followed Gael, but it would make sense that their families would be driven out with them. So we might be looking at like a parade of people, both some fighting men, but also it could be women and children. Okay, And so what it's saying is these are those who have been driven out of Shechem, and now they got to go somewhere else. It doesn't tell us exactly where they're going, but they're leaving. And so what does Abimelech do? He doesn't tip his hat and say, you know, nice knowing you. He does the same thing he did earlier. He lays in wait. They lay in wait in the field, and he looked, and there were the people coming out of the city. Now, these people are beaten, right? And they're not, they're not victors. They have lost. They are, you know, they're leaving. They have lost everything they have. And what does he do? He rises and he attacks them. Now, think back to what Jotham said. If you anoint this guy your king, there's going to be trouble. It's going to be like fire comes out of this guy because it's going to be more of the same, the exact same type of thing that we already have seen. Then Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood at the entrance of the, uh, the gate of the city, and the other two companies rushed upon all who were in the fields and killed them. They killed them. It's awful. 45, so Abimelech fought against the city all that day. Remember, this is, this is the city that he, you know, he was supposedly king over. Fought against the city all that day. He took the city and killed the people who were in it. So apparently he just, he kills the, the citizens. And he demolished the city and sowed it with salt. This is vindiction. This is awful. 46, now when all the men of the tower of Shechem had heard that, they entered the stronghold of the temple of the god of Bereth. Okay, so, so basically everybody that's left, they gather up into this temple, which apparently has a tower in it. Verse 47, and it was told Abimelech that all the men of the tower of Shechem were gathered together. Now, strategically, it's not good to be gathered together if you're in battle, but you can imagine what Abimelech's thinking. Then Abimelech went up to Mount Zelmon, he and all the people who were with him, and Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a bow from the trees. Now, that doesn't mean like a bow and arrow. That just means one of the main branches, just a big piece of wood uh, he cuts down, and took it and laid it on his shoulders. Then he said to the people who were with him, what you have seen me do, make haste and do as I have done. Okay, so they cut some branches and they're going to use them in their battle. Verse 49, so each of the people likewise cut down his own bow and followed Abimelech, put them against the stronghold and set the stronghold on fire above them so that all the people of the tower of Shechem died, about a thousand men and women. Uh, the, the depravity of this, this awful king knows no bounds. Verse 50, then Abimelech went to Thebes. And he, I promise, we're almost, we're just almost done. It's like, please make it stop, make it stop. <laughs> then Abimelech went to Thebes, and he encamped against Thebes and took it. Okay, so it's, it's almost as if his, his bloodlust then is aroused and he wants more. It's kind of like what we said, that chasm gapes and it's just never enough, especially when that sin nature kind of takes over. 51. But there was a strong tower in the city, and all the men and women, all the people of the city fled there and shut themselves in. Then they went up to the top of the tower. This is like exactly what we just saw, right? So Abimelech's probably thinking, oh, I know how to do this. We just did this. We just, it, you know, I, I know how to take care of a tower. 52, so Abimelech came as far as the tower and fought against it. And he drew near the uh, door of the tower and burnt it with fire. He's doing the same thing, 53, but a certain woman dropped an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. Wow, what a, what a warlord, right? I mean, what a powerful... But once again, he's taken out by a woman. Now, an upper millstone, basically what that is, is when you grind mill, you have two stones, a lower stone and then a stone on top that goes in a circle and crushes the grain. And so apparently, huh, that and then crushes his head. However... Sorry to say, he's not dead yet. Then he called quickly to the young man, his armor bearer, and said to him, Draw your sword and kill me, lest men say of me, a woman killed him. <laughs> wow. I mean, this guy. So his young... I'm sorry, I shouldn't be smiling. <laughs> uh, let me stop smiling. Mm. <laughs> so his young man thrust him through, and he died. Wow. 
This is just horrific and terrible. But it's what you get when you put your trust in awful leadership. 55, and when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man to his place. And that was it. Kill the leader, they leave. They disperse. And so his vision was being enacted. And once he's out of the way, they all go home and the rest of the tragedy is averted. 56, thus God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech, which he had done to his father by killing his 70 brothers. 57, and all the evil of the men of Shechem, God returned on their heads, and on them came the curse of Jotham, the son of, uh, uh, I keep trying to say Zerubbabel, Jerbal. And so what we see here is kind of two layers of God's response. For one, we see God responding to Abimelech's sin. And Abimelech ultimately is killed. His life is cut short. But we also see God responding to the sin of the people, and that sin being anointing Abimelech. And the way that he enacts that sort of discipline and that uh, retribution, so to speak, is through Abimelech. He lets Abimelech do, to some extent, what Abimelech wanted to do, and that shows the people how awful it is when you don't trust God, but instead you seek after salvation from other people. Now let's go back and just remember, what did Gideon say in the beginning? He said, I shall not rule over you, nor my sons. Now it turns out that Gideon was actually wrong about the son part, but his intention was that I don't want to rule you, and I don't want my sons to rule you. It's going to be God that rules you. And ultimately, they should have listened to him, because so much awful happened. Now, Once again, here we are at the end, and there's a question of what's the lesson? Well, don't be like Abimelech, I guess. Don't be like Gaal. Maybe be like Jotham, who runs away from sin. I mean, it's so hard sometimes to find a lesson in this, but I'll tell you what what kind of keeps coming to mind for me is this is the kind of garbage that the world has had to live with for eons. Now, we live in a nation where we are somewhat protected from this kind of depravity in a way. Uh, When we change a president or we change a mayor or we change a, a governor, we don't see violence for the most part. We don't see bloodshed. But I think when we see these sorts of stories, the people all through history that have read the Bible, they read this and they say, yes, we need an escape from this cycle because this cycle continues and continues. And I said it last week. I'll say it again, what is the escape from this awful, deplorable cycle? Ultimately, it's Jesus. It's Christ. Not only in the eternal sense, but in our daily lives. When we begin to follow Christ's teaching, it changes the way that we respond to situations. Let's pray.